So good afternoon, everybody. Hope you've enjoyed the first day of Lead Dev. I know I certainly have. It's quite the honor to be able to share this stage with so many amazing speakers. So thank you to the organizers and to Mary, the committee chair, and all the speakers who have presented to us today. Now, like Mary said, my name is Nicholas Means. I'm VP of Engineering at Wellmatch Health. I work with a lot of really smart people to help make the US healthcare system better. If you want to know more about what I do, come talk to me, because with a British audience, it's going to be a conversation. It's not, not something I, I can explain from stage. But another thing you need to know about me is that I am a student of plane crashes. I know that's a weird thing to say. Uh, but if you, want to, if you want to nerd snipe me, come up to me and ask me about a plane crash that I can't tell you the details about right off the top of my head. Uh, Joe, one of the members of the conference staff, did this to me last night at the speaker's dinner. And so instead of going home to the hotel and rehearsing my talk, I went back and looked up the details of a, a British Airways incident where the windscreen got sucked out of an airplane and the pilot got sucked out halfway. And they still managed to land and everybody survived. <laughs> it was British Airways flight 5390, if you want to go look it up yourself. Um, but it's not, it's not the morbidity of plane crashes or the spectacle that fascinates me. It's the dynamics of what happens in the cockpit, what the flight crew goes through from when an incident starts to when the plane gets to the ground, one way or the other. There's two kinds of ways this goes. There's some flight crews that take tiny incidents and through poor reactions or poor decisions, take tiny system faults and make them into giant disasters. Then there's other incidents where flight crews take giant problems, insurmountable obstacles, and somehow manage to eke out a better outcome than they ought to be able to. And the story I want to tell you today is the story of one of the latter. It's the story of a flight crew who takes a plane that's struck with almost insurmountable peril and manages to save more than half of the people on board. It's what I think is one of the most fascinating plane crashes in aviation history, the story of United 232. So July 19th, 1989 was an absolutely beautiful day in Denver, Colorado. The high was somewhere in the mid 80s, scattered clouds. There was a wonderful breeze blowing in off the front range of the Rocky Mountains. It was the kind of day, if you've ever been to Denver in the summer, it's the kind of day that just begs you to go outside and do something. Go for a hike, play around a golf. It was also a wonderful day for flying at Denver Stapleton International Airport. Planes were leaving on time. Everything was running smoothly. And at about 10.30 or 11 in the morning, the first of the 285 passengers and 11 crew members that would eventually be on board United Flight 232 started arriving at the gate. Their flight that day would take them from Denver Stapleton Airport to Chicago O'Hare, or so they thought when they crossed the jet bridge. If you were in the boarding lounge that day, you would have seen something like this through the window. It's a bit of an unfamiliar sight to a modern traveler. Uh, back in these days, it was forbidden for planes to fly extended distances with only two engines. They had to have more redundancy than that, so airlines invested heavily in what they called trijets, engines that had planes that had two engines under the wings and one mounted through the tail. And that's what you would have been getting on this day, specifically a DC-10, Series 10 aircraft, tail registration number November 1819 uniform. That picture is the actual plane you would have been getting on that day. It was an old but proud plane. It was delivered to United in 1971 and had been in service since then for about 18 years. Now, 18 years seems kind of old for an airliner, but it's really not. United would actually fly their DC-10 fleet well into its 30s. And you can still see these planes around the world today carrying packages and FedEx delivery. A lot of them are still operating. As you got on board, you would have seen something like this. If you've been on board a Boeing 777 recently, this cabin is just a little bit wider than that. It was a wide and roomy cabin. It was a quiet plane. And pilots loved to fly it. They referred to it as the Cadillac Fleetwood of the skies because it was such a comfortable ride. And the three engines gave it way more power than it needed. So they loved, loved being able to put their hand in the throttles and push them forward for takeoff and let the power of that plane slam them back in their seats as they took the skies. Around 2.10 in the afternoon that day, that's exactly what happened. It was a textbook takeoff out of Denver Stapleton. And they turned east-northeast out of the airport towards Chicago. And if you'd been in the cabin at that point, you'd have smelled chicken strips. United was running a promotion that summer they called their picnic lunch. So if you were flying at lunchtime, they would bring you a little basket covered in red and white checked paper with picnic lunch in it. And that day, it happened to be chicken strips, 
a few Oreos, and a cup full of cherries. Well, about an hour into the flight, most people had finished their lunches. The flight crew was beginning to pick up from lunch. Jim McKay, the legendary American sportscaster from ABC's Wide World of Sports, was about 20 minutes into explaining the history of horse racing in the in-flight movie Jewels of the Triple Crown. Sounds thrilling, I know. <laughs> and about that point, what had, become, what had been a completely normal flight up until then suddenly changed. There was a tremendous bang at the back of the airplane. Passengers thought maybe a bomb had gone off. The flight crew across the plane hit the deck and grabbed the nearest armrest, afraid that what they had heard was an explosive decompression and they might be sucked out of the plane. Well, it was neither of those things. What had actually happened is the fan disc in the number two engine, the tail-mounted engine, had exploded. On the flight deck, they had just finished their lunches when they heard this explosion. First Officer Bill Records, who had been sitting in that seat on your right there, immediately yells, I've got it! Lunges forward, grabs the yoke, disables the autopilot, and starts flying the plane by hand. Dudley Dvorak, the flight engineer who would have been sitting at that control console right there on the right, starts checking his gauges and immediately notices that the number two engine has failed. So he radios Minneapolis St. Paul Air Control Center, not to declare an emergency, but just to ask for a clearance to lower altitude. Because on a DC-10, I mentioned the redundancy of the three engines. It actually wasn't that big a deal to lose an engine. With the reliability of these engines built in the 70s and 80s, losing an engine wasn't all that uncommon. So standard procedure was just to request a lower altitude, slow down a little bit, and continue on to your destination. And that's exactly what they intended to do. About this point, Captain Al Haynes, who was sitting in the pilot seat that day, asks for the engine shutdown checklist from, from flight engineer Dudley Dvorak. Now, Captain Haynes at this point was primarily concerned with making sure that whatever happened to this number two engine didn't escalate into a bigger crisis. When an engine failed, it's, it's possible that it could be catching on fire or there could be physical damage, and he wanted to avoid making the situation any worse. So he asked Dudley Dvorak to start in on the checklist. The first thing on the checklist was to close the number, one, the number two throttle. And so Captain Haynes tried to do that, and he couldn't. It wouldn't budge, the throttle was stuck. So they moved on to the second step of the checklist. The second step was to shut off the, the fuel shut off to this engine. They tried that as well, it wouldn't budge. And it was at this point that they finally understood that something more than a routine engine failure had befallen their beautiful plane that day. The thing you need to know about the DC-10 is that the throttle and the fuel shutoff are both physically coupled to the engine via steel cable. If you think about how a bicycle brake works, it's the same theory. So the fact that both of those controls were jammed told the flight crew that there must be some significant physical damage to the aircraft. So Haynes and Dvorak were trying to figure out what to do next when Bill Records from the co-pilot seat shouts, Al, I can't control the plane, which is a terrifying thing to hear. <laughs> so Captain Haynes looks over, and Bill Records, with his arms as tense as they could be, has the yoke all the way back, all the way to the left. And there's two things about this that terrify him. The first thing is you would never give an aircraft that kind of input at cruise speed. It'd be like driving down the highway at 85 miles an hour and suddenly jerking the steering wheel all the way to the left. You would lose control of the plane if you did that. But even more terrifying than that, despite the fact that, that records had the yoke all the way back, which would command the plane to go up, and all the way to the left, which would command the plane to turn left, it was doing the exact opposite. It was descending and rolling to the right. So at this point, Captain Haynes yells, I've got it, and he takes the controls from Bill Records and tries to see if he can have any effect on the control surfaces of the plane. Meanwhile, Flight Engineer Dudley Dvorak is still studying his gauges, trying to figure out exactly what's happened to his beautiful plane. When he, something catches his attention, he glances up from his gauges momentarily out the windscreen of the aircraft and immediately yells, we're rolling. At this point, the plane is about 38 degrees of bank, which is pretty steep for a commercial plane. It'd be pretty uncomfortable if you were back in the passenger cabin. And immediately to an instinct that he still doesn't understand to this day, 
Captain Haynes swats the number one throttle closed, opens the number three throttle all the way to the firewall, wide open. And subsequent studies showed, subsequent, air, subsequent simulator exercises showed that in that moment, Captain Haynes saved their aircraft. Because after he did this, the plane slowly started coming back to level. Pushing the number three throttle all the way up and pulling the number one all the way back increased the lift on the right wing and pulled it up. It counteracted the drag that the failed engine was having on the tail. And with the plane now under relative control, uh, Dudley Dvorak makes the first announcement to the passengers. Now something I need to tell you is that this particular DC-10 only had a 30 minute loop cockpit voice recorder. And the actual accident sequence is about 47 minutes from when the fan disc ruptures to when the plane gets to the ground in Sioux City. So the first 17 minutes of the crash are really lost to history. But according to accounts from the flight crew and from passengers on board, what Dvorak said went a little something like this. Uh, wow, I jumped way ahead there. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we've lost our tail engine, but this aircraft can fly fine with the two remaining engines. We're gonna descend and continue on to Chicago. Perfectly reassuring thing to say to the, the people in the back of the airplane. But almost immediately after making this announcement, Dvorak finally spots the thing in his gauges that he's been looking for so intently and realizes that they, they have a much bigger problem on their hands than what any of them thought. He notices that on his hydraulic gauges, hydraulic quantity and hydraulic pressure across all three hydraulic systems are at zero. So he has no hydraulic pressure and no hydraulic fluid. And that means that he's not going to be able to control the plane. So at this point, Bill Records radios Minneapolis-St. Paul air traffic control and declares emergency this time and asks for a diversion to the closest suitable airport and they send him to Sioux City, Iowa. At about this point in the flight back in the passenger cabin, the overhead chimes ring in, in Jan Brown's section. Jan Brown is the one there on the far left in the turquoise suit and she's the head flight attendant on this flight that day. She looks around the cabin. She can see the rest of the flight crew. Nobody has their air phone off the hook. She knows it's not anybody in the cabin. She knows it must be from the cockpit. And she also knows that getting a call from a, the cockpit during the cruise phase of the flight was going to be nothing but bad news. Sure enough, Dudley Dvorak asks her to report to the cockpit. And she knows if she's being asked to report to the cockpit that it's certainly not good news. And telling this story later, Jan Brown says, my whole world changed when I opened that door. There was no panic, but the sense of crisis was absolutely palpable in the air. Captain Haynes told her, we've lost all of our hydraulics. We're having trouble controlling the plane. We're gonna try an emergency landing in Sioux City in about 30 minutes. So I need you to prepare the cabin and brief the passengers. My signal when we're about to land will be brace, brace, brace. And I need all the passengers in brace position at that point. Jan, I don't know how this thing's gonna turn out. So good luck. So Jan Brown musters a meager thank you and then ducks into the lavatory to compose herself before making the rounds and briefing all the flight attendants on the plane and beginning the preparations for this emergency landing. Meanwhile, Captain Haynes asked Dudley Dvorak to look in the flight manual and find a procedure to handle complete hydraulic loss. The FAA mandates, yeah. <laughs> Y'all are ahead of me. So, so the Federal Aviation Administration in the US mandates that any likely failure modality that's gonna strike an aircraft has to be documented in one of these checklists. You have to have a, a set of failure procedures for when anything goes wrong. Well, there's no checklist. Of course there's not because nobody ever expected a DC-10 to lose all of its hydraulics. And it's at this point that Minneapolis St. Paul Center finally hands the flight over to Sioux City, Iowa, and Captain Haynes makes this initial contact with the tower in Sioux City. Okay, so you know we have almost no controllability. Uh, very little elevator and almost no aileron. Uh, we're controlling the turns by power. I mean, we can only turn right, we can't turn left. United 232 Heavy, uh, understand, sir. Uh, you can only make right turns. <laughs> Sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> so you, to understand what Captain Haynes is saying there, you need to know a little bit about how airplanes are controlled. He says we have very little elevator and almost no aileron. 
So the elevator is the control surfaces here on the horizontal stabilizer at the back of the plane. And that controls the plane's movement up and down. So in saying they have no elevator, he's saying they have no ability to control their altitude. He also says they have no ailerons. Now ailerons are these surfaces on the back of the wing that control roll going into turns. They would use the smaller inboard ailerons at high speed crews and the larger outboard ailerons when they were going slower close to the ground. They had neither set. So they couldn't control the altitude of the plane. They couldn't control the roll of the plane. And he doesn't say it, but they don't have any rudder either. So they can't, control the, they can't even control the yaw of the plane. They're literally only controlling the plane by the thrust from the two engines. Well, shortly after this exchange with air traffic control, Jan Brown has composed herself, and she's making her way back through the first class section, and she's briefed Jan Murray, who's in the pink there on the left with her arm in a sling. And Jan Murray begins walking through the first class cabin, picking up leftovers from lunch and starting the emergency preparations for landing. When Denny Fitch, who's on your right there, gets her attention. Now Denny is another United Airlines DC-10 pilot, and he's commuting home from Denver to Chicago. And he likes to say about himself that he has a radar for people in distress and that Jan Murray was clearly in distress. So he gets her attention. And he says, Jan, don't worry about this. This thing flies fine on two engines. We simply have to get to a lower altitude. And Jan Murray leans down so as to not be heard by overpass other passengers and says, oh no, Denny. The pilot and co-pilot are fly trying to fly the plane, but they've told us we've lost all our hydraulics. Well. As a DC-10 captain, Denny Fitch knows there's no way that's true. <laughs> because in addition to being a DC-10 captain, Denny Fitch is a DC-10 check pilot. And he actually spends his days in Denver at United Airlines Flight Simulation Center torturing other pilots through full motion flight simulators. He's literally been through every emergency scenario that they expect to occur on a DC-10. He's taken pilots through it to see how they react. And he's never heard of a DC-10 losing all of its hydraulics. So he tells Jan Murray, would you please go let the captain know that he has a DC-10 check pilot riding back here, and that I'd be happy to come up and offer any assistance that I could. Well, Captain Haynes, upon hearing this, readily agrees, hoping that this DC-10 check pilot will have some magic incantation or know about some secret switch that will fix their plane <laughs> and give them control. But when Fitch gets to the cockpit, he looks over Dudley Dvorak's shoulder at the gauges. He sees no hydraulic quantity, no hydraulic pressure. He checks the bus bars to make sure there's not an electrical fault that might explain loss of flight instrumentation. There's not. And he knows he's never seen anything like this. He says, at that point, the only question I had was how long it was going to take Iowa to hit me. <laughs> so I've alluded to this several times. Uh, but Losing all hydraulics in a DC-10 was considered an impossibility. The reason for that is the DC-10 is built with three redundant hydraulic systems, one powered by each engine. And each control surface on the plane was controllable by at least two of those hydraulic systems. And what's more, the DC-10 was one of the first generation of aircraft, along with the Boeing 747 and the Lockheed 1011 TriStar, that had no manual reversion. And what that means is if you're flying on, say, a Boeing 737, a smaller plane, and you lose all your hydraulics, the flight crew can still wrestle the yokes and get some response out of the flight control surfaces. It'd be like going down the highway and losing your power steering. You can still steer the car, it's just gonna be a lot more work. Not on the DC-10. The control surfaces are so large and the forces acting on them are so strong that it would be of no use to provide manual reversion. You can only move the flight control surfaces if you have hydraulic systems. So without any of their three hydraulic systems, the research that had been done indicated that one of two things would happen. One, the plane would go into an uncontrollable flutter and fall to the earth like a leaf. Or, like this plane had tried to do, it would roll over on its back and go into a descent so fast that it would actually tear the wings off the plane before it ever got to the ground. But neither of those things happened. United 232 stayed in the air. Well, at this point, since Denny Fitch didn't have any magic fixes, Captain Haynes asked him to take over the throttles because it was much easier for someone to kneel down between the two seats and control the throttles at the same time than for him and Bill Records to control the number one and number three independently and try to coordinate their actions. 
Meanwhile, Captain Haynes radios Sioux City again to reiterate the direness of their condition. We have no hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control, uh, almost none, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. Have you got uh, some place near there uh, that we might be able to ditch? Unless we get control of this airplane, we're going to put it down wherever it happens to be. And then in the air traffic control audio, there is this really uncomfortable pause <laughs> where Kevin Bachman tries to figure out what in the world to tell this flight crew. And he comes back with a really strong answer. United 232 Heavy, Roger. Can you pick up a road or something up there? We're trying. It's still uh, anywhere from 2,000 feet up to 1,500 down now in waves. Roger, come on. Can you pick up a road? Thanks, Captain Obvious. <laughs> so in that bit of audio, you can hear one of the things that the flight crew is fighting about this plane. And it's called fugoid oscillation. It's actually one of the default flight modes of an aircraft with no flight control surfaces. What happens is a plane without flight control surfaces will immediately dip into a dive. And slowly, it'll build airspeed over the wings, which will build lift. And the plane will return to an ascent. And it will go up for a little bit until it loses airspeed, until it loses lift on the wings and start to descend again. The plane is trying to find equilibrium between the lift on the wings and the gravity acting on the plane. If you throw a paper airplane off of a tall enough building, you'll see it do exactly the same thing. It'll flutter to the ground going up and down in a fugoid oscillation all the way to the ground. But Captain Haynes gets a crucial fact wrong in this call to Sioux City Tower. He said that they were going up 2,000 feet and down 1,500 in each wave. Those numbers are backwards. Flight 232 was actually losing about 500 feet of altitude for every fugoid cycle that they went through. You can see it when I add that dotted line. So Captain, Captain Fitch is sitting there with the throttles. You've already heard that the plane wants to turn right. So he's trying to mitigate the plane's tendency to turn right. In addition to that, with just the two throttles, he has to mitigate the tendency of the plane to go into these fugoid oscillations, try to get it to fly level. Because if they can't control the fugoid, fugoid oscillations, they have no chance at getting this thing to the ground. They will fugoid oscillate their way straight into the earth. You can hear how well this is going in the next air traffic control transmission. There's the airport to us now as we come spinning down here. United 232, I have a Sioux City Airport. It's about 12 o'clock and three six miles. Okay, we're trying to go straight. We're not having much luck. We're trying to go straight, but we're not having much luck. Denny Fitch is getting the fugoid oscillations under control, but he's not having much luck with the right turns. If I show you the radar track of the flight, you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you can see the plane enters this chart at the bottom, and it's going up, and it enters a turn towards Chicago. And right at that triangle in the upper right corner is where the fan disc on the number two engine fails. And after it fails, the plane enters into a very wide sweeping turn. And about the bottom of that turn is where Denny Fitch takes over control of the plane. And you see it wanders a little bit as he, tries, as he figures out how to control the turning. But then as he starts to work to figure out how to control the fugoid oscillations, they go into a series of very sharp right-hand turns. This would actually prove to be fortuitous because it's the only thing that allowed them enough time to descend and to be able to land in Sioux City. About this point, Jan Brown is walking from the back of the plane when a passenger told her to take a look at the rear stabilizer. This passenger had seen a big piece of metal sticking up out the window. So she looks. Sure enough, she can see it. She goes to the cockpit. She tells Dudley Dvorak the same thing. And Dvorak comes back to take a look. And there's a picture of this flight taken from the ground as it's approaching Sioux City Airport that you can see exactly what they were seeing. If you look closely at that rear stabilizer, you can see there's some places where daylight is peeking through where it shouldn't be. If I put a normal DC-10 tail next to it, you can see it a little bit more clearly. Specifically, there's holes punched in the rear stabilizer. It's missing the exhaust cone, exhaust cone on the engine, and the plane is missing its tail cone. There's actually 70 separate pieces of shrapnel that pierced the tail section of this plane. And they all came from this. 
an object they found in a cornfield in Alta, Iowa, about three months after the crash. They didn't find it in intact. So you can see on the right of this disk, there's clearly a crack. They actually found the two halves of the disk in separate places, and they found each of those fan blades in a separate place. This had completely separated. What you're looking at here is the front intake fan of the GE CF66 turbofan engine that powered the DC-10. If you look at an aircraft sitting on the tarmac at any airport, and you see the fan in the front of the engine, this is that fan. You can see that there's a containment ring around it, but that containment ring is designed only to contain the weight of one of those fan blades letting go. Those fan blades weigh about two pounds a piece. The fan disc, about 350. So there was absolutely no chance that that containment ring was gonna contain this fan disc. And if you look at the placement of the engine in the tail of a DC-10, you can see it's perfectly mounted to cause a ton of damage to that rear stabilizer. Not intentionally, that's where it needs to be mounted for the aerodynamics of the plane for that engine to be efficient. But when this fan disc failed and was uncontrolled, all of that fan disc went flying through the tail of the aircraft. And the reason that's important is because the tail of a DC-10 is the one place in the entire plane where all three redundant hydraulic systems come together. Of course it is. So when they lost the number two engine, they lost the number two hydraulic system because the number two hydraulic pump is attached to that engine. The shrapnel knocked out the number one and number three hydraulic systems. Immediately after the explosion, some of the passengers on the plane reported hearing a siren-like sound. What they were actually hearing was the hydraulic pumps attached to engine number one and engine number three, working as hard as they could to bring the hydraulic system back up to pressure, but actually pumping every last bit of hydraulic fluid they had overboard. Well, while Dudley Dvorak is at the back of the plane looking at the stabilizer damage, Denny Fitch finally pulls off something that they had thought was impossible up to that point. He makes a left turn. This is the only left turn the plane was gonna make all day that day, and it was a crucial left turn. They had to turn left in order to get pointed back towards Sioux City Airport. If they missed their approach to Sioux City, there wasn't another airport anywhere within range that they would be able to make it to. So they desperately wanted to get to Sioux City in order to attempt a landing. And in congratulations, immediately after they make this left-hand turn, Kevin Bachman, Bachman radios them with this. You know, 232 heavy, you're gonna have to widen out just slightly to your left, sir, uh, to make the turn to final and offset, I'll take you away from the city. Whatever you do, keep it away from the city. Can you widen out a little bit to the left? Do, the, do that impossible thing again for us. But you can hear the desperation in Captain Haynes' voice there. He's still not very hopeful of their journey this day. The crew's still fighting to suppress the fugoids and keep the plane lined up with the airport. They're working as hard as they can to try to bring this plane to Sioux City, Iowa. And you can hear the relief in Captain Haynes' voice when they finally spot the airport. United 232, heavy, roger. And I'd advise me to get the airport in sight. Got a runway in sight? We'll be with you very shortly. Thanks a lot for your help. Sounds pretty relieved. Finally has a little bit of hope. A few minutes later, Kevin Bachman calls back with their landing clearance, which is probably my favorite air traffic control exchange in this whole sequence. United 232 Heavy, the wind's currently 360 at 11, 360 at 11, you're cleared to land on any runway. <laughs> you want to be particular, make it a runway, huh? <laughs> so in the midst of this crazy incident, I don't know if this is pilot gallows humor or if it's him actually being this controlled, but he has the wherewithal to crack this joke with air traffic control about landing on any runway. Well, it turns out they actually do get lined up with a runway, but it's a runway that's been closed since World War II. And it happens to have all of the emergency equipment sitting on it. And there is a runway uh, that's closed, sir, that could uh, probably work too. The south, it runs uh, northeast to southwest. Pretty well lined up on this one, or I think we will be. Uh, all right. Yes. United 232 Heavy, uh, Roger, sir. Yeah, that's a closed runway. That'll work, sir. We're getting the equipment off the runway, and they'll line up for that one. How long is it? 
6,600 feet, 6,600, and the equipment's coming off. So they get lined up to a runway. It's a closed World War II runway. It's not in great shape. All the emergency equipment's on it. They're in their five-mile final at this point, so they're really close to the airport when they're having to scramble all of this emergency equipment off of this closed runway to other places on the airport. Now, their emergency planning procedures called for them to be on this runway because it was in proximity to the other runways at the airport. It was a convenient place to respond from. So they had to try to figure out how to get out of the way of this plane that they had no way of predicting where it was going to go. Shortly after this, Haynes gives the brace, brace, brace command. And the flight attendants begin shouting, brace, in unison over and over again. A couple of passengers stick their head up to look out the window to see how close they are to the ground. And the flight attendants immediately yell, get your heads down. And as 232 lined up, the tower got excited. They were actually lined up with the runway. They were going to make the airport. Kevin Bachman at one point stood up and screamed, they're going to make it. But then people started noticing that 232 wasn't floating like arriving airliners normally appeared to do. It was coming in very fast. And the reason for that is because without hydraulics, they had no slats or flaps. Now, slats are flight control surfaces on the front of the wing, and flaps are on the back of the wing. And they extend them when the plane is flying slow because it gives the wing more lift. The plane needs that extra wing surface when it's flying slow, low to the ground, in order to have enough lift to not stall. Without slats or flaps, if they slow down for landing, they're literally going to stall out of the sky. They're not going to have enough airspeed to make it to the ground. So as a result of this, 232 that day was traveling at 250 miles an hour as it came in for landing. Normal speed for a DC-10, about 125. So they're going twice as fast as they ought to be going. The sink rate of the plane is even more alarming. They're descending at 1,800 feet per minute. Now, the structural integrity of the landing gear was rated for 600 feet per minute. But that would have been the hardest landing you'd ever experienced. A normal landing in a DC-10 was 200 to 300 feet per minute. So they are absolutely plummeting out of the sky. A few minutes before they hit the ground, you can hear the ground proximity warning system tell them to pull up that their plane's in danger. And Captain Haynes says, our luck ran out about 50 feet above the runway. The plane went into one last fugoid oscillation, and the wing dipped right, right as they got to the ground. And they made first contact with the right engine nacelle, and it spun the plane around. The impact was hard enough that it knocked the, number, the damage number two engine completely out of its mount. And without that weight in the tail of the plane, the lift of the rear horizontal stabilizer was enough to pull the back of the plane up and over, and it cartwheeled down the runway. Because of the 30 minutes advance notice that they had that this plane was going to crash, there actually is news footage of this plane coming in and crashing. And I do have that video. I'm going to show it now. I, I will warn you, if you're squeamish, you might want, not want to watch. There is a good bit of fire and smoke. So you can see how fast that plane's coming in. It's not floating. It's coming in really quick. And somewhere behind these trees and buildings, that right wing makes the first contact with the ground. And you can see it come sliding through with fire and smoke. About here, you see the rear come and cartwheel over. And it continues sliding down the runway with the jet fuel leaking out of the tanks. They, they had they had ditched as much fuel as they could, but they had to have enough to get to the ground. And you can see what's remaining in the plane catching on fire with that acrid black smoke that's rising up from the wreckage. Here's the crash site. They slid across the airport and ended up in a field of soybeans. That patch of concrete that's at an angle at the top of the screen is the closed World War II runway, uh, runway 22. The plane actually hit hard enough that it drug a six-foot ditch in that runway with its landing gear just tore the concrete right out of the ground. Kevin Bachman, at this point, left the control tower to weep because he had just watched the crash. And he knew everybody had died because how could anybody live through that? But as rescuers arrived at the plane, a strange thing started to happen. People started to emerge from the wreckage, some of them without a scratch. There's a story of one passenger who was walking away from the plane, seemingly unhurt, turned around, walked back to the wreckage, got his suitcase. <laughs> and they would later find him in the airport bar drinking a glass of whiskey. <laughs> so 
So 232 was still absolutely a tragedy. 111 people died that day. But of 296 people on board, 185 of them survived. Now there's a bit of context I need to give you so you can understand the significance of that 185 number. Up until this point, in the previous 25 years of commercial aviation, no one had ever survived the complete loss of flight controls of an airliner. Nobody. 185 survived this day. The National Transportation Safety Board is the, the US government body that investigates plane crashes. And there's a telling line in their report as well. They say the safety board believes that under the circumstances, the United flight crew performance was highly commendable and greatly exceeded reasonable expectations. Reasonable expectations this day would have been nobody surviving. The NTSB, in the process of developing their report, did extensive simulator exercises. They configured DC-10s and simulators for exactly the flight conditions that 232 fa faced that day. Very few flight crews that they put through the simulator exercise got the plane anywhere close to the airport. Nobody was as successful as this crew. So how'd they do it? What made this flight crew different? Well, let me let Captain Haynes tell you himself uh, in, in a speech that he gave at NASA's Ames Research Facility. The preparation that paid off for the crew was something that United Airlines started in 1980 called cockpit resource management. Up until 1980, we kind of worked on the concept that the captain was the, the authority of the aircraft. Whatever he said goes. And uh, we've lost a few airplanes because of that. Now, we had 103 years of flying experience up there in the cockpit trying to get that airplane on the ground. Not one minute of which we had actually practiced, any one of us. So why would I know more about getting that airplane on the ground under those conditions than the other three? So if I had not used CLR, if we had not let everybody put their input in, it essentially wouldn't have made it. So what Captain Haynes is talking about there is, is modernly referred to as crew or cockpit resource management. And it's focused on the human dynamics of the cockpit. A United 232 is actually considered one of the first big success cases of crew resource management. It's focused on interpersonal communication, leadership, and decision making. And it's actually based on research that was done by NASA's Ames Research Center. So it's interesting that that's where he was giving this, this speech. There were a couple of crashes where stubborn captains not listening to their flight crews had caused tiny problems turning into big disasters. Uh, one of the most notable was United Flight 173 that crashed outside of Portland, Oregon. And what the crew was facing that day was an indicator, indicator that told them that one of their landing gear was not down. Now it turned out their gear was down the whole time. It was a faulty switch in the wheel well. But they spent so much time flying around trying to troubleshoot the problem. And despite the urgings of the co-pilot and the flight engineer that they were about out of fuel and they should return to the airport, they crashed four miles short of the airport because the captain wouldn't listen. He was insistent that there was a landing gear problem and they needed to fix it. So there's a couple of tenets of crew resource management that are very relevant to how we spend our days as software engineering leaders. First of which is no heroes. See, cockpit resource management emphasizes cooperation over heroics. One of the things that struck me as I was doing the research for this talk is Captain Haynes deliberately uses the word we when he's talking about the sequence of events. He says things like, we were at 38 degrees of bank and increasing, so we closed the number one throttle and firewalled the number three. Now, he uses the word we there to talk about the moment that he, Captain Haynes, saved Flight 232. He lets Denny Fitch stay on the throttles long after it's obvious that that's all that's controlling the plane. It would have been really easy for him to go, okay, this is the only control we got. Denny, get out of the way, it's my ship. But instead, he recognized that Dennis Fitch had been sitting at the throttles long enough and had developed that rhythm, had, had developed an intuitive understanding of how the airplane was operating under these conditions. And that it was best to let Denny Fitch continue to do that job rather than him asserting his authority as the captain of the plane. Now how do we do that as software leaders? Uh, we need to encourage our teams to work together to find solutions to hard problems. And we need to celebrate, celebrate success as a team and learn from failure as a team as well. We shouldn't look for individual heroes and individual scapegoats. We should live as a team and die as a team. One of the best ways to do that is to make sure that everyone has a voice. You heard Captain Haynes say it. If everyone on the plane hadn't had input, 
it's a cinch we wouldn't have made it. There's an obvious, clear connection to software teams here. As leaders, we desperately have to avoid allowing our teams to develop dominant voices. We especially have to make sure that those dominant voices aren't our own, because it's really easy to get into that cycle. It's really easy to forget, as either an explicit or implicit leader on your team, the weight that your comments have. You can guide your teams effectively because of the authority that your voice carries, but it's a double-edged sword. You can also create conditions where you're the only voice that's guiding your team, and other people are afraid to have input. This is especially true with new engineers. You need to give new engineers space to develop their identity in software, to assert their, their growing authority, and to make the mistakes they need to make to learn and grow. If there's only one dominant voice and it's constantly correcting new engineers on the team, they're never gonna make the mistakes that they need to make in order to learn the lessons they have to learn. It's also essential if you're building a a diverse team, and you absolutely should be, because of the diversity of perspective and expertise that it brings to your team. But if you allow dominant voices to take over the conversation of your teams, you'll find it very hard to attract and keep diverse talent on your team. Because voices that are used to being marginalized will pick up on that pattern very quickly. And they won't hang around to give you the benefit of the doubt and see how it's gonna turn out. So if you want to build diversity on your teams, you have to make sure that everybody in your team has a voice. You have to cultivate that team culture. One of the interesting things about cockpit resource management is that the captain is still the captain. Every decision that's made in the cockpit still comes down to him. So as a team lead, you do still have authority. But in cockpit resource management, the captain's job is to ensure that he uses his authority to make sure that every voice on the cockpit is heard, everybody has input, that he's heard every idea available. Without that, it's really doubtful that this crew could have gotten this outcome out of United Flight 232. They wouldn't have made it to Sioux City Airport. They wouldn't have gotten to the first responders who got every survivor to the hospital in under 45 minutes. They would have been crashed in the middle of a cornfield somewhere in Iowa, and it would have taken the response much longer. And the outcome that day would have been far different. So remember that software is a team sport. Building software takes technical skill, but building the right software takes human interaction and lots of it. So make sure you're building that kind of culture on your team. A lot of our teams tend to look like those flight crews that brought planes down. Let's work together to look more like the crew of Flight 232. If we do that, if we, if we focus on building that kind of culture on our teams, we will do amazing things together. Thank you. <laughs>